welcome to the Motivated Martial Arts Podcast. Your hosts, Jackson White and Gavin Cook, have been friends and Taekwondo training partners for over 40 years. This podcast will bring you a mixture of their life stories, martial arts, and business experiences to motivate you in life and throughout your martial arts journey. Adding in a mixture of inspiring interviews and some of the best traditional martial artists around today. So over to your hosts, the Motivated Martial Artists. Welcome to the Motivated Martial Artists podcast with me, Gavin Cook. And me, Jackson White. And this morning, we would like to welcome on the show the Ninja Nomads. So we've got Alex McCall and we've got Sam Anderton, who are calling all the way from North Island, New Zealand this morning. Um, we're really excited to get these two guys on the show. Obviously, we know them from, uh, from training together in the UK and they're recently decided to do a bit of traveling and they're traveling around and they're sort of launched an awesome um, couple of YouTube channels to, uh, to help inspire some of the youngsters and show off some of their kicking and tricking abilities. So we're super excited to get these guys on the show. So I'd like to say hello, Alex and Sam. Hi guys, thanks for having us. Great to be here. Uh, awesome to have you on the show. And I'm going to pass over to Jackie as always to fire off with the first question. Hey guys, great having you on the show. I think you're our first world, double world champion couple that we've got on. So that's, that's always a, a, a milestone, which is great to have. So I always get the privilege of asking the first question. So really, it's going to be, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. One, one to the left, one to the right, maybe, because we want to know about <laughs> both of you. So give us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and uh, ultimately how you got into a martial arts. So hang on then. I know Alex is keen to kick off, so let's kick off you with go. Sam. Yeah, go on there, go on, Alex. You kick off first, sir. That's cool. Um, so I'm from Devon in the southwest of uh, England in the UK, and um, my mum actually got me and my two brothers and my little sister all into martial arts when we were young. We were sort of end of primary school age, so I think I was about 12 when I started. Um, and yeah, she was already doing the fitness kickboxing classes, my mum, with um, the taekwondo instructor Peter O'Neill from the TAGB in the southwest there. And um, she kind of took us along. We weren't like naughty kids or anything like that, but we was a little bit wild. <laughs> Uh, there's four of us and just my mum, so she sort of took us there to the to Taekwondo class and it sort of just snowballed from there. Um, and we all took it uh, pretty seriously for a long time. Uh, so we've done well there. And what about you, Sam? I'm from the northwest of England uh, near Warrington. Uh, I grew up in a family that was not sporty whatsoever. I was the only one who seemed to want to do any sort of physical activity. Uh, I've done karate from the age of seven up to about 16. And then I started the Taekwondo when I got to university. I just needed another outlet and I wasn't—I couldn't go to my old karate club. So I thought I'd try something new. So I started the Taekwondo and built it up from scratch there. Okay, okay. so that sounds interesting. <laughs> go on, Jackie, you go. So from um, Alex, when you first walked into that, uh, that dojo, how long did it take you to start getting into martial arts? Because, you know, I think most people never... Well, most people that we've interviewed never go to a martial arts club or pick a particular martial arts. They're always taken to it or pushed into it and tend not to enjoy it too much. So when did you really start enjoying it? And what did, what did you like about it, first of all? So for me, it was crazy. We, as kids, I don't know if you guys were the same, but Jackie Chan was on TV all the time for us when we were kids. We loved anything like that, you know, Ninja Mutant Turtles, all that kind of stuff. Turtles. So we always want to jump around. Alex, which, you know, was, your, which, which was your favourite? <laughs> oh, Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, we was always, you know, jumping around and trying to do kicks and that kind of stuff. But when we actually started the Taekwondo, I did not like it. I was not good at it. My mum was really good. She loved to fight. My sister was just awesome, a real natural ability. She was just such a good kicker, super technical, super strong, super tough as well. Uh, and me and my two brothers, my two brothers, I think, were actually better than I was, um, were kind of just there. And my mum and my sister got really into it, five nights a week, training all the time, competing, winning, all the stuff they were doing. Um, and me and my two brothers were not. Uh, and, I, and I really sort of resented having to be there a lot of the time. Whereas, whereas now I look back and go, God, I wish I'd taken it seriously. Um, all that time that I, I was there, but not really training hard when I was watching other people and it, it was kind of like seeing how good my sister and mum were with sort of natural talent and me having absolutely no sporting talent whatsoever 
really struggling to do the very basic stuff. And my two brothers were there, you know, enjoying it, um, but not not great at it. Uh, but re- they were sort of enjoying it, and I was like the only one who felt I'm sort of really behind everyone, can't really catch up, and all my friends are better than me, my family's better than me. I have to be here five nights a week. I'm I'm just not improving all this stuff. So I sort of struggled until I was a teenager, and then. Uh, my family moved associations and I just got sort of stopped stopped Taekwondo and so I had about four year break and when I was at university uh, I came back to Taekwondo thinking oh yeah I used to do this I'll be super good I'm, I'm really good at doing all this stuff uh, and very quickly realised I was probably the worst black belt in the country uh, I think my first competition I got absolutely battered at like the southwest or something and I got the lowest scoring patterns out of every black belt there and that was kind of a, a little bit of self-awareness was just like, you're not very good. You need to start training if, if you want to want to be good at it. And it was just kind of from there. Uh, my instructor was super into like discipline and fitness and, and getting you sort of enthusiastic about it. Um, and so that paid off for me in, in my early 20s when I really got into Taekwondo was, was getting on YouTube and seeing all these cool, you know, I'd grown up watching the likes of Warren Weiss fighting, just brilliant, uh, Tyrrell Bellany and Carl Betty and some of these guys, awesome kickers, um, getting on YouTube, watching some of their fights too and, and seeing the likes of Ashley Beck. I know you spoke to him recently, doing the trick kind of stuff and the musical forms, Chloe Bruce and people like that. And that kind of was like, all oh, right, cool, this is, this is what I really want to get into. And it was just really hard graft for a long time to get anywhere, to get any good. Yeah, it's interesting. We talk, we talk a lot about people just getting that, uh, especially when you start as a, a, a young child or a teenager. A lot of people, much like myself, you, ju- you just turn up because you're told to be there and you just go through the motions. And then you have this, this epiphany, or I call it the awakening. We haven't spoken about it for a long time, have we? Yeah. All of a sudden, <laughs> you just wake up. There's a moment where you just think, do you know what? If I want to be good at this, I've actually got to put some graft in. And then all of a sudden, everything yeah. starts to change. You, you understand that you've got to, you, if you, the more you put in, the more you will get out of it and the better you will become. And yeah, we call that, I call, I always call that the awakening. And you, and you see it in kids. Some kids get it, you know, when they're five or six, the, the odd one percent. Yeah. And then others, it takes them five or six years to get it. And you know, I get the parents saying to me, Oh, he doesn't seem to be as progressing as well as everyone else. I said, Well, yeah. eventually keep him coming, keep the moves going. You know, he'll get there and he'll wake up and all of a sudden, It'll just click. It's just that moment where everything clicks. It's that light bulb moment, isn't it? You see, all of a sudden, you see, you see the light bulb go on. You think, "Oh my gosh, this, this kid's actually got it." So, yeah, yeah just, absolutely. Just um, so you're saying um, that when you first got back into Taekwondo after uni, that you you felt that you wasn't a very good black belt and you was really struggling with your patterns and stuff like that. I think it's quite yeah. um, it's quite good for our listeners to hear that because obviously you're you're super well known now for your um the amount of medals and, and world championships and stuff that you've won in patterns and musical patterns i think for our listeners to hear that when you first got back into it you felt as though you know you know you wasn't like I say you i was going to use yeah. the word crap but i'm going to use it anyway <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, absolutely so i like i said i had that kind of epiphany moment at a competition where I, you know i hadn't done it as a teenager but i kind of had that teenage attitude of you know what, yeah, I'm top dog and I've got a black belt and I'm, you know, I'm this, that and the other. And instantly realised, getting the lowest score in the entire division, that I was no good. And then it was... Can you remember thing what pattern it was? Can you remember what pattern it was? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Gay Beck, one of the first damn black belt patterns, um, with a couple of kicks in that I, I wasn't flexible at all. In fact, I remember in my 20s, the first time I could ever touch my toes with straight legs. <laughs> so... A lot of the time I get said to me, oh, it's, it's super easy for you to do these kicks and these jumps or do a good pattern and stuff because I haven't seen the absolute graft and graft and graft. Like people, like fighters that are hammering away at, at their sparring training and drills and working on movement and ring awareness and ring craft and all this stuff. Exactly the same when it comes to the technical side too. So the patterns require the same amount of effort as sparring. Uh, the musical stuff, the trick stuff, all that, all the different avenues and sort of in taekwondo that you can take and and i love sort of all the taekwondo so one of the things i've always enjoyed is is hammering technique drilling patterns drilling fitness drilling sparring drills drilling kicking drills absolutely hammering the 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 trick inside of it so the acrobatic taekwondo the somersault kicks land on your head right get up shake it off do it again land on your face right get off wipe your nose do it again and just i kind of love that 
that that hard work aspect, that real perseverance, if you like. Of, that's, um, that, that, of that's, that's why uh, those goals. That's that's why I stick just to to a reverse punch to the nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't like the hard work aspect, Kevin. <laughs> Works every time. Works every time. It's like that. It's like that scene out of um, what is it? The um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Is it Raiders of the Lost Ark? When you get that guy oh, yeah. like, doing all these doing all these like fancy moves, the gods guy pulls out a gun and shoots it. <laughs> uh, well, I never said I'd do a backflip kick when I'm sparring. What about you, Sam? What What about you? When you first walked into that dojo the first time, you, you mentioned you did a bit of karate at uni. You wanted to do your yeah, taekwondo. Was... What, what What did you like about it? When I was young and I did the karate, I was a bit of a goody two shoes kid. If I, if I was going to do something, I wanted to be the best at it. I wanted to be the one getting complimented by the instructor and getting all the praise I just used to I used to love the hard work especially and I'd go into all the squad sessions uh, me and my friends started together which was a good boost um, we were both on the England team for the karate and the junior uh, junior team for a couple of years and then when I went back to ended up starting the taekwondo again um, it was just it was a totally different experience I just felt really out of place I was starting something from the beginning again because I was the second down in karate so I was kind so what of style, what style of karate did you do? Uh, show to Ken. Okay, cool. Uh, um, just, uh, like, sorry, so, sorry, Sam. No. Just, um, just sort of take us take us through some of the differences that you found between obviously being a second in karate to starting totally as a beginner from, in taekwondo. You just, I was, like I said, I just felt really out of place. I felt like I was, uh, people expect you to have an advantage, some sort of, because you've got that base. Um, but sometimes it was more of a hindrance than a help. I'd be in class and. Obviously, Alex is known for his critiques, some patterns and stuff. So I'd be constantly getting critiqued and it because he, he knew that I was doing it because I'd learned it in the karate. So cool. it's just little things, little differences in stances and uh, little differences in foot positions with the kicks. So it was just like I had to kind of delete things from my head and relearn it like from the start all over again. But it's, it's difficult though, isn't it, when you've done something from an early age and you've built that muscle memory up as a youngster, yeah. it's very hard to get rid of that, isn't it? I, I think still do it I, now. I'm still yeah. rubbish at front snap kicks. Alex, <laughs> Alex laughs every time I try and do a front snap kick. Still do the wrong foot position. And so I still, it's a good job I've got him here to remind me constantly. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't think you ever lose it, though. I think any anything that you learn when you were a kid, when you're growing up, so, so from their sort of ages, sort of, sort of four or five, through to sort of 13, 14, you know, the, the skills that you learn while you're growing at that time, you never lose them. They're, they're always going to... I bet, I bet if you were to walk into that karate class now, you'd, you'd be, be, be bounced instantly. You'd be back on it again. Yeah, it was, it's definitely muscle memory. I've, I've, I went back to a few classes when I was around 16 and I, have, I probably hadn't done a class in months and I can still remember this stuff. It's just getting back into it. But I, I do prefer the taekwondo, um, which is why I've stuck with it for, for the whole time. I was a bit worried when I started. I didn't know whether I'd be able to get through that first few stages where you feel a bit silly and you, because when you're 19 and your mates are getting ready to go on a night out and you're getting in your your dobok and you're going down to university to do a class, you always feel a little bit silly. So I'm glad I, I pushed through that first bit and made it to the black belt point. It's handy. You're handy. Your boyfriend's your mentor, your coach, as well as your boyfriend. Then. Yeah, it's it's weird. We um we actually met properly at a D side a competition, um, is when we actually started talking, wasn't it? And then we messaged from then. But it's I didn't really know you were part. Of, we I didn't know Alex as an instructor because when I started, I started under Warren. And um, they both did different Warren classes. Vice. Yeah, so Warren Vice. I started. He did a, a class at Edgehill University, so I joined there. Uh, and then I met Alex a few, a couple. A martial arts in couple. So just talk us through how your arguments go. Does it start off? <laughs> <laughs> does it start it off starts, on the key subject starts. and then end off? Well, my snap kick's better than yours. Or if you don't but, watch it, I'm going to spin on you. <laughs> the arguments are very short because I'm always right. So oh, the there we go. Yeah. He, the quicker he realizes, the better. And we've decided now if we ever have a disagreement, we just rock paper scissors. It. <laughs> Not okay. worth so it. get your sparring and gear no on. Matter, no, no matter who wins, paper scissors rock. Sam wins. Sam wins. Oh, it's oh, okay. out goes. Yeah, as all men will know, that women are always right. <laughs> of course.
Right, well, you seem to have worked that out very, very quickly, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, 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 yes. So, so just to take, so taking it back to your competition then days, you two. So obviously, I know Alex, you're sort of certainly well known on the um, on the UK circuit for your sparring, your patterns, and your musical patterns. Okay, which um, which of the which of the disciplines do you prefer? Um, it's a difficult one for me. Like I said, I, I kind of love all aspects of Taekwondo. I, I love to spar. I love to fight. I, I love to do patterns as well. I really, I mean, some people sort of prefer one over the other uh, and they don't sort of find the crossover there. But I think being good at patterns helps you in your sparring. If you've got really good technique, you've got good understanding of how your kicking works, how hip twist helps you develop your power, all this kind of stuff, all the same kind of things that you throw when you're on the pads. Um, I think it can really help you. Obviously, I like the musical patterns, mainly because it kind of gives you an avenue to the more acrobatic stuff. Um, so you can try your, sort of your 540 kicks, your, your back flip, somersault kicks, flash kicks, things like this. Um, as a nice little avenue there. There's not much sort of musical patterns, as you know, in the TAGB, which is a little bit of a shame. If you look at some of the, um, the freestyle taekwondo or the kickboxing, uh, they've got some, because they promote it quite heavily, They've got a real, really high standard because there's so much competition. And much the same in the TAGB, the sparring standard's so high because there's so much competition. Um, so hopefully in the future, they'll get a bit more of that, a bit more of the team patterns coming in there. There's, there's a lot of juniors doing that now as well. And so that will sort of build up, get a little bit more um, respect in there and, and a bit more of a higher standard as well. But um, yeah, so I don't really have... I don't really have a preference. I'm obviously more well known for the pattern side than the sparring. Um, I have been British champion in sparring and patterns. Uh, patterns more than sparring, obviously. <laughs> but I, so I'm more well known for the pattern side of it. So what, talk, what about so yourself, talk, Sam? Um, I, I love to spar, um, but I do. I'd, I'd say if I had to pick one, I do prefer the patterns, but mainly because I, I suffer with uh, anxiety. And getting up in front of a group of people who are all watching you around the ring has been a big challenge for me. So I, everyone says I have a pattern face and I just look really angry. And the main reason for that is I'm trying to stay in zone and not get too anxious. So the fact that I've been able to push through that and be so successful in the patterns was, uh, has been a really big thing for me personally. But I do love to spar. Uh, Especially going into from the colour belt to the black belt division, it's been like a big jump. It was it was good to challenge myself again. So, and I've only done the musical patterns once, but I'm hoping to compete a little more in those as well. It's, that's interesting because a lot of the the fighters that we've had on the on the podcast, uh, they feel exactly the same uh, with their patterns as you do to sparring. You know, they they'll do anything not to get out on that in that centre air arena and do their patterns, but they're quite happy going out and get seven bowels knocked out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, re- they're really interesting yeah I, th- yeah I think when it comes to patterns it's it's a bit different to sparring that when you spar how well you spar often depends on not just how you've trained and your sort of your mental preparedness if you like but the other person that you're fighting mm-hmm. so and and the referees to an extent as well but when oh, it well, comes massive, to patterns have a massive effect on the on, on the back yeah doubt. absolutely yeah. but when it comes to patterns when you get up there to do a pattern it's one the onus is 100% on how you perform, how you've prepared yourself, what you do in that moment. Scores notwithstanding. I mean, sometimes you get better scores, worse scores, doing exactly the same thing. It's kind of subjective in that way. But the actual performing aspect of it, it solely depends on what you do. So if you make a mistake, it's no, you can't say, oh, well, that fighter did this or they did that. It's 100% what you've done and how you've sort of prepared yourself for that, which I think is really good to sort of have that being able to take responsibility for, for how you perform. So that's one of the things I really like about patterns. And for kids, as I've taught for six years full-time uh, with Warren Vice um, before we left to travel, when you're teaching children, that's really, really brilliant for helping their confidence. So if you've got uh, little Johnny's coming into the class, he's super shy, he's not very social or whatever, getting them kids to repeat those movements over and over again, they're practicing, they're getting up at gradings, and parents will see the difference in a couple of months. And they know after that first or second grading, the parents are so happy because their kid got up there. They're smashing their moves. They're coming up to you. I oh, he did so well, didn't he? I was brilliant. Oh, he loved it. Oh, we loved it. And it can be such a boost. Um, I think it's a real positive effect 
as the kids are coming up. I mean, not everyone's going to be the world's best fighter when they're coming into doing martial arts. And not everybody wants to be the world's best fighter as they come in as well. They might be there for personal reasons or fitness or whatever. There's so many different reasons now to do martial arts, um, especially for kids. Yeah. Um, and, and anything you can kind of do to help develop that um, when they're that age. And I think the, the syllabus-based stuff, that's kind of the difference, I feel, with, with Taekwondo and, and some of the sort of more traditional martial arts to say, the MMA or the boxing where the quality kind of depends on the coaching more than the, the discipline. Whereas I think with Taekwondo, the discipline has more to say uh, in that respect as, as they've got so many different ways of developing with line work patterns, step sparring, free sparring, all this kind of stuff. There's a lot more there for them to sort of progress through and, and have little goals to achieve, which I think is really positive. It's, it's having those, it's having those sort of bite-sized goals that you're going to achieve through the syllabus, isn't it? You know, we talk about this a lot on the podcast about the, the benefits of um, having those incremental belts that you're going through every two, three months, or whatever, yeah. four or five months. You know, they're like little mini wins, aren't they? You know, and, and quite yeah. often, and you'll you'll probably see it as well, same as myself and myself and Jackie doing our clubs. You know, quite a lot, quite often. Going back to what you were saying originally as well about not enjoying martial arts when you were young and wanting to quit and stuff like that. And you certainly see a lot of the kids, you know, towards as they're getting towards the, the point where they're about to grade, that's the point when they're starting to lose interest a little bit because they've already had, you know, three, four months of training. And then all of a sudden they need that grading just to push them over and give them that boost of confidence yeah. again. And then they're ready to go again, aren't they? And it's a bit of a, yeah. you know, it's like that sine Absolutely. wave, isn't it? You know, that all of a sudden they're going up and then then all of a sudden they get that they get that boost and then they're back on it again and they wait ready to go again. Um, just talking about obviously the benefits of martial arts in general. Um, question for you, Sam. Really, you mentioned um, in sort of the last a couple, a couple of seconds ago about um, anxiety. About you, obviously, you suffer from that anxiety. How do you feel as though uh, martial arts or taekwondo and karate specifically has helped you overcome that sort of anxiety? Um, mainly because, like I said, with the patterns. The idea of getting up in front of a crowd of people watching yet a lot of the time that would tip me over the edge Alex knows he's, he's sometimes asked me to get up in class and demonstrate a pattern and I've just been looking at him like why like, don't don't ask me to do that in front of everyone and uh, it's made me push myself being in the especially in the taekwondo and getting up the belts I did a lot of teaching in the club um, and people were looking up to me they were I was coaching at competitions and they were kind of looking to me as a role model so I was having to push through those boundaries then so that the younger kids would have someone like to look up to especially the young girls got a lot of young girls in, in our um old club who were amazing at both the patterns and sparring so having them kind of there to push me really helped um but the the anxiety everyone says uh they're always really shocked when I say I've got anxiety because they're always like oh you hide it so well and but it's um People don't always understand that like, it's a different sort of anxiety. It doesn't mean that I'm, I can't talk to people or I'm not like outgoing. Um, it can strike at any time. I can be absolutely fine in a group of people and then all of a sudden someone will say something or something will happen and I'll just shut down. Mm -hmm. So the, the Taekwondo has been, it's, it's great, especially the competing. It's just pushed me and spurred me on to keep challenging myself. Just, just, um, just talk us through then, Sam. Let's say, let's say it's a big competition, and you've entered the patterns, and you, and you, and we all know what it's like that waiting around the competitions. It's dreadful, isn't it? You're just like constantly waiting. You're warming up. You're cooling down. You're warming up. You're cooling down. When's my turn going to be, etc. So you're there, and you're waiting for you, waiting for your chance, your time to go on on that square. Have you ever been hit by sort of a bout of anxiety at that sort of point, and thought, I can't do this? And, and talk us through your your I suppose your thought process on how you push yourself to get yourself on that square yeah definitely the, I think the main one thinking about was uh, I can't remember if it was a British or any I think it was an English uh, championships quite recently and um, I'd only just got my black belt and it was the first time I was doing a black belt pattern uh, in a competition so I was freaking out I'd only just learned the pattern a couple of weeks before the competition so I was freaking out, what if I forget it and what if I do this? And you'll know at competitions, they don't like you standing up around the ring before mm -hmm. you pattern. And I have to be stood up going through the, the moves in my head and 
they made me sit down all the way until my turn. So I got up to do a pattern and I nearly forgot it on the first go. Um, came off and then I knew I'd have to play off again. So I, and what happens when I get like a burst of anxiety? These little voices start going through my head of the what ifs and oh, you're going to forget it and what will people think and this and that. And the, the main thing I have to do, I just have to keep drilling the moves in my head, try and drone out the voices and just be like, you know this, you've trained for it, you've worked for it, you know the moves and you just got to kind of push on and step onto the ring and do the best you can and not worry about other people and what could happen. Uh, that was basically, that was the only way I could push for it. I just had to concentrate on myself and kind of zone everyone else out. Uh, certainly, when when I've watched you compete over the years, you hide it very, very well. So it's a, you know, a real credit to you. You, know, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it from the performances that you put out there, and the, and, the, and the confidence that you radiate as well. So yeah, it's it's, it's really in, interesting to hear. Yeah, I think that's part of the performance. So you've got to look confident when you're competing. If you if I'm stood at the side of the ring and everyone can tell how nervous I am, I think they straight away they've got that edge. It's just like if you go to um, to a sparring match. And you're looking across at the other person, and you look scared. They've already won the fight. Oh, That's yeah. no point. Like they've already won. So if you if you can look across the ring and you see, oh, they're scared in your head straight away. You're like, I've got them. You've won. It's, it's that so balance of energy, wanna, isn't it? That yeah, I never want to radiate that to people. So sure. yeah, I mean, yeah, really Jack, Jackie knows all about that because he always gets scared when he knows he's got to face me at a competition. <laughs> yeah. <don't Jackie>? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fear oozes out of me, Gavin. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, so you obviously you you're sort of you you you've got you both got your black belt. Obviously, I know Alex, you're a, you were for your fourth dan. You know you had you were running your clubs. You know you were teaching, you were teaching the children. You then you just both decided to um, to take a break from uh, martial arts in the UK and go travelling. Um, and I know sort of to help help support yourself while you've been travelling, you've been doing your your YouTube videos and your your blogging and stuff like that. So you've almost become this now the new. Um, a conversation that we're having a lot these days is you're almost becoming a, a virtual virtual martial, art, martial artist. Obviously, you know, it's a conversation we're having a lot because of the coronavirus um, everywhere. I know as instructors, we're all having to go online. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, about your travelling and where you've been and what you got up to and how you've sort of um, used your... Um, people sort of started filming your martial arts and stuff like that and, and sticking it onto YouTube and how, how your YouTube videos go and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, also keen to hear about why you decided to travel because you know quite established in the UK. So yeah, what, what was your thought process to be behind the travelling? Okay, yeah. So we just um, come back from the World Championships in 2018. Uh, We've been pretty successful. Some won a double gold there in sparring patterns as a black belt. Um, I'd won a, a gold and a silver, I think, as well in the team patterns and the musical there. So we we come back. We had a real high from from competing. Our students did really well. Uh, great competition. Love watching the, a lot of the stuff going on. And um, I can't remember how it came up, but we were sort of talking about traveling. And we've always kind of talked. You know, you always talk about. You know, wouldn't it be great to go there? Wouldn't it be great to do this? Mm-hmm. And we got back after the competition. We started talking about it again. And then it was kind of like well, we, we don't own the house we rent, or we don't have a car at the minute and these kind of things. And we don't have like financial commitments in any one place. Um, working with Warren, um, I could leave the clubs there and the students don't go without an instructor. They're, still, they're, they're all still there. Warren's, you know, he's the chief instructor there. He's smashing it. Clubs are busy and all the rest of it. Um, so that was something I could sort of leave to one side as well and think, so what, what do we want to do? Do we want to stay in the area? Do we want to travel? And we kind of committed ourselves to the idea of maybe going away for a couple of months, even just a few weeks, and, and trying to explore some areas. And it just kind of snowballed from there. We got onto what um, working holiday visas are, you know, where you can go and travel Australia for a year. If you do a bit of work there, you can extend that again. Uh, and it just kind of snowballed there. Yeah, it was good timing, wasn't it? So I just finished my master's, and it, it was either we go travelling now or I was going to get settled in, in a job. So, so what did you do for your, uh, for your master's, Sam? Um, physical activity and mental health. Okay, fantastic. So I thought if it's better to, we've, we were like, it's better to do it now while we're not tied down anywhere and mm-hmm. then we can come back to all this stuff and maybe set up a club after we've done the travelling. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big part of it as well as, as 
working with Warren's been a, a, an amazing experience and the, the second Taekwondo clubs are fantastic. The students are amazing, really, really good. But at some point we need to sort of spread our wings and, and have a go ourselves and, you know, we've got a lot to offer too. So that was a part of it. And we like, you know, we, there's no rush for us to do that anytime soon. Um, we'll have a little explore of the world and, and see what we get up to. Um, so, yeah, we spent most of last year, most of 2019 in Australia. Uh, we spent about eight months there. We travelled from the west coast to the east coast, all up and down the east coast and back again. Did you go to um, Byron Bay, so Alex? Did you get to Byron Bay? We certainly did get to Byron <laughs> Bay. How, how awesome is it there? I love that place. <laughs> Beautiful. It's just, you know, Australia is just an amazing country. The landscapes, the wildlife and the people as well. It's a, it's a totally different vibe to anywhere that you could possibly go in the UK or most of Europe, to be fair. Um, you, while we were there, did you take we a trip a real... to Nimbin? I don't think we went to Nimbin. Did we? No, no. Didn't go to Nimbin. Everyone goes to Nimbin no. when they travel in Australia. There's, there's, there's so, too, yeah. too many places to see. It's so big. <laughs> Every well, time this, this is Gavin yeah. trying to. So, t- trying to allude to us that he's obviously been to Australia as well, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I know yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, but I, I did exactly what you guys did. I was just, uh, you know, I was in my, in my early 20s and I wanted to have a year over there and it's, I loved it so much. It was uh, uh, such yeah. a such an awesome place, for sure. But, look, but yeah, lucky for us, he came back, didn't you, Gav? Unlucky for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it was an amazing experience, but while we are there as well, obviously, we love doing the taekwondo and we love competing. Uh, we're also, I've always been sort of if if you're on my social media you know i'm constantly putting up the latest flip that i've learned or the latest kick that i've done or whatever um for anyone who cares to see i like putting it out there and it's good for me to look back and go oh that was good maybe i, should, I haven't done that for a while or oh i'm much better at that now let's just try that again or do these different bits and bobs um so we thought while we're traveling try and keep training as much as we can so we're super lucky we got to go to train with tony curtis and some of their guys in perth a couple of mm-hmm. times that was yeah, Tony, uh, fan of the show we've had him on interviewed him as well yeah, yeah fantastic what a guy and and they've got a fantastic set of clubs over there lovely academies super welcoming Did some of the standard there's really high as well so that was great experience and that was on the west coast in perth and then we went to the east coast um, I got in touch with a guy called Michael Tan, who runs a sort of WTF Taekwondo Family Academy in Brisbane. And he invited us down there to teach. Uh, so I ended up running some classes there for him uh, every week and doing some private lessons and all that kind of stuff. And he was fantastic as well, super welcoming. Just, and we're a totally different style for those who don't know. Uh, the CGB is kind of, kind of a, an old school original ITF style of Taekwondo. And the WTF is like the Olympic style of Taekwondo. Uh, so it's a totally different style, but he was super happy to get us in. He'd seen us on social media, actually, on the YouTube as well. Um, seen our kicking ability and competing and that kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, come in, have a teach. That It's great for the kids to, to have somebody different, even if you're teaching the same stuff or new stuff or whatever. So that was great. Uh, so, yeah, we're getting to teach there. We also went to Bali and Kuala Lumpur um, several weeks each. And we actually got to teach in Bali as well. There was a taekwondo club there. Um, and they invited us down to do a class and to meet some of their guys, and that was really good as well. So, Alex, so just stop being there. So, did you did you get paid for doing these um, these these classes for these instructors while you were abroad? Did I freeze? One that? more time, Gavin. Sorry. Did I freeze? Yeah, so sorry. Yeah. Time. Yeah. No. Did you um, did you get paid for doing uh, teaching when you was in Australia and Bali? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're quite happy to pay you while you're there to, to do a couple of classes and stuff. And they're quite keen to get you in. So it's like just another way to motivate their students. Any instructor will know when you're teaching your classes, no matter how varied you try and be, you uh, unfortunately, you can become monotonous, even if you're always looking for new games, new ideas, because it's mm-hmm. you teaching and so you, have a, you probably have a way that you teach and your students kind of become accustomed to that. And so sure. any different way you can sort of motivate them to keep going to get over the hurdles all kids will want to quit whatever sport they're doing at some point and it's trying to find a way to navigate through that time and make sure you're pushing them forwards yeah yeah, yeah. Um, no, i mean the, the, the main the main reason i'm asking for the uh the, the payment side alex cause obviously it's a conversation that i have obviously in my club quite a lot obviously being quite entrepreneurial you know i'm, I'm trying to sort of say to some of these kids look you know you, if you're not academic or if you don't want to go to university or you don't want to follow the traditional route you know, keep up your taekwondo, keep up your martial arts, because one day you could be earning a living from doing it. You could be an instructor. 
you could be in the movies, you yeah. could be a stuntman, you could be a, you know, there's so many things you could be. And I think it's just, you know, it's interesting you hearing that, you know, that you just, you know, because you've got a skill set, you know, you've got a skill set, both of you have got an awesome skill set that you can just go to Australia and where a lot of people are like, well, what we're going to do now, we can do food picking or we could go pot washing. You could, you guys could walk into a dojan and say, look, you know, I can teach your kids and get paid. And you've almost got a, a ready-made job because of the skill set that you've got in martial arts. And it doesn't have to be, yeah. you have to be good at English and maths to, to get a good career. I suppose that's where I'm trying to go with it, really. No, absolutely. We would recommend, though, if you're in school, <laughs> course, you're uh, yeah. taking your English and your maths seriously. Oh, you stop it, Alex. Without... <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, you know what? It's, it's something, it's a transferable skill. So even mm-hmm. if you don't do martial arts as your full-time job when you're older, having the kind of discipline, respect for yourself, respect for others, the confidence and the fitness and all that kind of stuff that's sort of just built into the kind of disciplines that taekwondo offers or boxing and any of the different martial arts that, you know, that are worth doing it's it's for kids as well if you can get them in at an early age you're kind of setting them up they're going to be fit they're going to be healthy they're going to be pretty well behaved um they're going to be confident they're not going to be victims of any kind of bullying because confident people don't tend to get bullied confident kids don't tend to get bullied yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's one of those core skills isn't it absolutely and um it's something that as an instructor, most people will know as well, trying to get parents on board, especially if they're and are and when they first walk in the door, once they've seen what, if you're good, once they've seen what you do, what you're teaching, and the difference it makes to their kids, they're shooting, they're so positive, they can't wait to be engaged with the club and, and supporting all the rest of it. Um, so it's been really good for us, being able to teach while we're abroad, we've loved it. Um, and training ourselves, it's, it's been quite difficult to to train obviously because we we spent a lot of time traveling between different cities and up and down the coast all that kind of thing and exploring you you don't have access to a full-time gym you don't have access to a full-time martial arts club so we've been trying to do get the buy some pads take the pads do our own sessions like we would do for other people if i would do one-to-ones private lessons or classes Mm -hmm. we'll try and set ourselves up we'll do a session we film it as well a lot of the time we can watch it back and go oh we did that really well. We didn't do that well. We'll tweak that next time. Uh, and that's how we sort of got on to deciding with our Taekwondo for the YouTube, uh, for the YouTube channel that we've set up. Um, is we did have a Patreon account where people could pay to come and see our stuff. But obviously with the coronavirus pandemic, which is just sort of changing the world at the minute, we thought we don't really want to compete um, with clubs back in the UK that, you know, we're good friends of, good supporting. Uh, supporting these clubs so we thought we'll cancel the patreon so nobody's paying us to do online stuff for the time being and we'll put it out on youtube for free so people can patterns but yeah basics you can add on to your training repertoire um And that helped keep us motivated. Two of us, the competition, we're not getting to go. We're really keen to keen to keep on top of, and, and like I said, doing the YouTube channel has has really helped us sort of stay focused and make pads out, go through your patterns, do you stretch and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so that's been been pretty really positive. So, so, so whereabouts in the world are you now then? And, what, where, and where are you planning to move on to next? Ah, so right now, um, we're in New Zealand, in a place called Tapuke, which is sort of the, the Kiwi farm capital of the world. Um, we was only in New Zealand for about a week before um, the country went into sort of, or a week or two before the country went into sort of a full quarantine lockdown. So we managed to get uh, some jobs working as kiwi pickers on a farm so we're kind of staying there until the quarantine eases off uh, and then we've got a visa for the rest of this year so we're going to try and explore as much of New Zealand as we can and go to as many different martial arts places gyms taekwondo hopefully uh, boxing that kind of stuff and, and explore train with different people and yeah so we've got no set plan that's the great thing about traveling yeah. for anyone that's interested is you don't have set plans so if tomorrow we decided you know what we want to sack this off we want to go to vietnam we can just do it we've got nothing that ties us down anywhere and even if you have a set plan that often when we have made plans the amount of times that we've had to, to change the last minute 
um, is, is crazy. So if you, if you do, if you are interested in the travelling, you've got to be ready to adapt and be change your plan at the drop of a hat. Yeah, because yeah. anything can happen with the coronavirus. Anything can happen. So you just got to be ready. That's it. I always, I always found the most difficult thing from coming back from travelling is just getting back into the normal life again, isn't it? It's you get so, you get so used to that travelling and that easy life of just um, get a job when you want to get a job and then just quit a job when you want to quit it and do a bit more travelling and move to somewhere else. You get so used to that, and all of a sudden you come back and it, it sort of hits you with a bit of a bump. It's like right, you know, you know this is the, you know, especially obviously if you guys decide to start a family and need to settle somewhere. You know, it's, um, I don't know, if, is, that, is that, that ever on the cards, you two? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <Plenty of time laughs> for that. Early days, yeah. She's still young and I still look young, so we've got plenty of time. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't commit to anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought we might get yeah, that so commitment we... on the podcast then. <laughs> well, we, we've actually just hit our five-year anniversary there the yeah. other week, so right, she's still putting that with me, so I must, I must be doing something right. <laughs> Ah, good stuff. So we're coming coming towards the end now, then, team. So one thing I always ask is, um, you know, saying that you're still quite young, both of you, but you know, going back, what sort of advice would you give out to anyone that's thinking, uh, any any of the martial artists that are thinking of, uh, you know, just picking up their bags like you've done and setting off on their travels? What sort of advice would you give them? Uh, so it's a couple of different things, really. When it comes to the travelling, do your homework, do your research, like you would at school. Get online, find out where you want to go you know vaccines you might have to have the currency exchange all these things that that, the boring stuff really but if you're on top of it you'll enjoy your traveling a lot more because you don't have to worry about it the last thing you want to do is get to another part of the world you haven't got your family there to look after you you might not have many friends with you or if any um so you kind of have to have a little bit of sense back to know what you're doing um if you're a martial artist and you're traveling again do your research if you go into a certain part of the world have a look what martial art clubs there are there. Have a look. I mean, obviously, being part of the TAGB and Taekwondo International, there's Taekwondo from all over the world that, that comes to compete with us. So, like I said, we, we met Tony Curtis in Australia in the first city that we went to. Um, and it tends to be, if you do martial arts and you meet other martial artists, super friendly, super welcoming, want to chat to you, talk about the differences. You show us a bit of your training. We'll show you a bit of our training, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a really positive experience and it's it's really eye-opening as well if you're kind of always super focused on one aspect of your martial arts say if you're a fighter you're always just only ever do your, your sparring training and your fighting um, and then you might go to another club and they want to work more with you on uh, maybe the acrobatic stuff if you're interested in the martial arts trick in there and that I mean if, you, if you're practicing doing three spins in the air and a kick it makes doing a reverse turning kick in your sparring a lot easier. <laughs> it's, a, it's just one of those things, again, transferable skills. Um, yeah, it's, do your research, do your homework, know where you're going, what you want to do, um, but be prepared to sort of change at the drop of a hat. Yeah, I was going to say, if I was going to give advice, to some, especially to me, before I was going to travel, was stop overthinking everything. It will work out. Like If, if you just got, as long as you do your basic homework, Mm-hmm. stop thinking everything's going to go wrong same with your martial arts stop overthinking it enjoy it if you enjoy it it's the most important thing and if you're going to enjoy it then you're going to work harder at it whether it be traveling whether it be your, your martial art training so there that's most important for me I, th- I think that's I think that's good advice in in just in life in general isn't it yeah. don't over, don't overthink things things will happen you know, things that will happen that are out of your control that you can't, you can never predict. I mean, you think about the coronavirus, you know, it's nobody's fault. It just happened. There's nothing you can do to change it. you just got to adapt and you can't worry and overthink things because things will eventually work itself out in the end, I think. It's been absolute pleasure having you on the, uh, the podcast uh, today. Uh, we wish you all the best in your travels and uh, no doubt we'll be continuing to uh, look at your blog and, and see where you're going. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Where, where, where can people find you? So, where can people find you? What, what's your YouTube channel called? So, we've got two YouTube channels. We've got one called the Ninja Nomads, which is where we sort of uh, put up our travel videos, where we're going, what we're doing, places we've been, that kind of stuff. And we also have a Taekwondo uh, sort of coaching aid channel, which is just called Alex and Sam Taekwondo. You can just go on YouTube and type those in, and you can find us. If there's videos that people want to see, how to do this kind of kick or how to improve their patterns or this kind of drill, whatever, they can just message us. 
uh, and we will just make little videos and put them up there as well. Uh, people can grab us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, those kind of things as well, and they can follow us on our journey there too. Right, I've just hit subscribe, so you've got another subscriber now <laughs> on the Ninja Nomad. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and hopefully we'll see you on our, our new the Motivated Martial Artist Live uh, platform as well in the, in the near future, where people can yep. uh, search you up and look at some of the some of the uh, awesome stuff that you're doing. So again, Fantastic. thank you very much, guys. Keep safe. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Take care, Stay guys. Bye. See you soon. Bye, 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 bye. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your listening platform. It would be awesome if you could also leave us a review. We really appreciate your value feedback. Also, check out our website, themotivatedmartialartist.com. We also have a YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook page and Facebook group. All the links are available on the show notes below. We'd like to thank again our show sponsors, skillsconnect.co.uk, the world's leading children's development program for martial arts. If you're a martial arts school owner or instructor and are looking for some inspiration, ideas or drills for your children's classes, make sure you check the skills out.